Good Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. Today we're, we're pleased to have uh, Mr. Richard Walker with us to talk about daily activity simulator for household. Uh, Mr. Walker is the manager of the Molly Service Division and Metro. He's also chairing the Oregon Molly Steering Committee. Uh, the DASH model uh, is a activity-based model that has been under development at Metro and is to replace the current model and become the next generation of the Portland or Portland region's uh, travel demand model. Uh, with that, I will give the room to Mr. Walker. Okay. Thank you, Li Ming. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know who my true friends are. Choosing Dash over the sun, that's a tough, uh, <laughs> tough choice. So this is really an exciting time for us in the modeling world. There are so, such an array of new tools that are emerging. What I'm talking about today is an activity-based model, but there's so many changes happening with land use models, um, dynamic traffic assignment, if you're familiar with that, different ways to simulate the flow of vehicles on roadway networks. All sorts of things are happening in the, in the tools we use. So with this, I want to talk about DASH. Now, notice the name of DASH. Uh, this aggregate, um, let me see, I always forget the name. OK, the Dynamic Activity Simulator for Household. Notice that there's not one reference in that title to travel or transportation. But yet, this is a tool that we're going to be using for that. The point is, the tools developed today, these activity-based models, are all about estimating daily uh, day, trip, uh, day patterns, You know, arranging your day. What do I have to accomplish for the day? Where do I have to go to, a, to meet those ends? How do I get between place and place? So it's much more than just travel. It's arranging your day. So that's what this is. the focus of this model is. Okay, so here's a uh, pretty long overview of what DASH is all about. But what I really want to focus on is just those three last bullets. Uh, those are the three things that really distinguish this new generation of models with past practice. And the first of those is the socioeconomic roles of individuals. Activity-based models are all about modeling the travel for individuals. Past models have been the household. Now we're d uh, drilling down. We're focusing much more on individuals. So when you think about individuals, each of us are different. We have uh, different roles in life. We have different economic situations. We have different auto ownership situations. We live in different environments. We have different uh, relationships in our life, You know all these things. And they affect how we choose uh, to travel or the kind of things we do during the day. That's very important. You'll be hearing that theme over and over again as I uh, talk today. Uh, next point, temporal dynamics. What we're talking about here is that what's interesting about this model is that it is one that is going to basically march uh, through the day. Okay, So the model is going to start at 3 in the morning. And it's going to be evaluating at conditions at, I don't know, something like 15 minute increments all through the day. So why do you want to do that? Well, the reason is, is because when a person is making a choice, you have to have the conditions that are in place at that time when you're making that evaluation. How much transit is available to me at that time? How frequent is, is it coming? For example, if you're living by a peak only line, that certainly affects what you're going to be doing in the off-peak, OK? Uh, if there's a toll, for example, perhaps it might be a dynamic toll. Toll might be higher during the daytime, sorry, during the uh, peak times, less during the midday conditions. That might affect how you make your choices, things of that nature, OK? So what is happening at the time of your choice is important. The final point, intra-household dependencies. Those are really huge. And research has shown over and over again how important it is 
that um, the different kind of characteristics in your household, they affect your travel so much, okay? If you're single, living in a household, I mean, you have, you have a lot of, let's say you're living by yourself, you have a lot of freedom, flexibility to do what you want, when you want, pretty much. If you're in a household where you have a, a spouse and a child, perhaps, that child kind of takes over your schedule, okay, in terms of getting them to school, uh, being involved in their ap after-school activities, things like that. So uh, another example is just carpooling, for example. If you and uh, your housemate choose to carpool on a certain day, that creates an obligation where potentially you just may have to carpool on the way back. So again, that's going to influence your schedule, your time, you know, all those kind of things. Intra-household dependencies play a very big part. Those are, I would say, probably the biggest three things that distinguish these new models from prior ones. So again, you'll be hearing more about this as we go through. Okay, here's the project team. Perhaps some of you know uh, Dr. John Glebe. He's a professor, uh, assistant professor here at Portland State not too long ago. He's now with a consulting firm, RSG. He is the lead consultant on this project. He actually started this tool, DASH, when he was at the university here. So that's where all of the initial thinking, the initial framing of how this model might look like, it all started right here. So when uh, he left to go to the consulting firm, um, you know, we, we followed him to kind of bring that vision to life, so to speak. So he's our lead consultant on this. And then you have uh, several people involved in that. Cindy Peterson is here, sitting right there. She's one of the partners on this. So Cindy, you can raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to talk about? First, what are some of the key issues in terms of uh, motiv motivating the design for a tool such as this? Why do we need to add the, quote, complexity to such a tool? We'll then go over some of the key elements within this model, the framework of it, the, structural of it, the structure of it, and then where are we, okay? Okay, our motivation. There's a host of policy issues that are, that are facing us. You know, all the decision makers have big policies. So what I want to do is just go through a few of them and indicate how this tool uh, can be used to better address them. I'm trying to find a place so you can see, okay, are you all right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, for example, VMT reduction. That's a huge issue. You know, that's, that's a driving force behind a lot of decisions. How can we reduce VMT? So um, this model will continue to have all the different kinds of modes available to you that you might choose uh, to make a journey, walking, biking, car, transit, park and ride, etc. cetera. Uh, one thing this thing will add that prior models have not is the ability to bike to transit. That's become a very big emerging question, okay, and TriMet has asked that a lot. You're starting to see it more and more, okay. Obviously, it adds a whole lot of flexibility to uh, the bicyclist in making choices. So that's something that's being added. Um, let's just go, let's just jump to that household obligation again. When a policy is introduced, you know, it's up to the models to try to uh, assist the decision makers to see what will be the impacts of such a policy. And it's a big thing. Um, I think a lot of the current models might got in, have been focusing on how people would react to it. But I think there's another important word there, if people will react to it, okay? Maybe I'm being... Uh, a little too focused there with semantics, but the point I want to make with that is this. When some type of a policy is being introduced, depending upon an individual situation, they may or may not have a choice in how they react to it, okay? So for example, um, let's say some type of a toll is introduced in some fashion, okay? And there's it's maybe it's some kind of a toll across the Willamette Bridges here, or, you know, I'm just being very uh, hypothetical here. But let's say a toll is introduced. Well, if you have a job, you know, you go to school, and you live on the east side, and you need to get to downtown here, 
you know, you really don't have any choice in the matter, <laughs> okay? You pretty much have to do that. Now, you do have some flexibility in choosing mode, things like that. You could certainly choose to live somewhere else if you wished, if you have that flexibility. Those are certain response mechanisms. But there's some people who just don't have a choice. Let's say you have a child that's attending, uh, let's say, a, a grade school or something, some, and they're attending school, and you, you're responsible for picking them up. No matter what the policy is, you need to be there to pick them up, okay? So there is no choice for you with regard to, to a response to that policy. So I think this new model is going to be much more responsive to the not only how people respond, but if they can even respond in the first place. Toll assessment. I mentioned that this tool will be very focused on uh, the role of individuals. We're going to be modeling individuals now. And as I mentioned, they will each have different kind of roles. I'm going to talk more about roles in a moment. But generally speaking, when I do say roles, I'm talking about um, you know, your household status. Are there kids? Are there not kids? Uh, perhaps are there, you know, um, car ownership might be in there a little bit. You know, they're just different roles that you've got. And so with regard to that, that leads to different kinds of value of time. How do you trade off cost versus time? How much are you willing to spend to do some to get there more quickly? Okay, and all those different roles that a person might have, they're going to have different um, different kinds of value of time. Okay, they're going to be responding differently. If you're on your way to work uh, and you're going to the big board meeting at 8:15, and you're the master of ceremonies, you better be there. Okay, if you're uh, just going shopping, having an afternoon of uh, fun or something, you know, your schedule is pretty free. It, it doesn't matter so much. But boy, if you need to be someplace on time, it's important. And so that's, the roles are doing a much better job of capturing how important this travel is to you in terms of scheduling. Emissions. Because we are modeling people at such a fine level, we're going to be getting a much better uh, simulation of, of flows on our roadway networks uh, with regard to when they travel and uh, things of that nature. That will, as you go through the logic chain here, lead to a better estimation of speeds, okay, which leads to a better estimation of emissions. Not so much for greenhouse gas, but more the criteria pollutants like carbon monoxide, things of that nature. So um, that's another big deal. There's one interesting side note that I want to bring up now with regard to emissions. Um, again, I'm saying this over and over again. Since we're talking about the travel of individuals and where they live, you're going to be able to travel, travel along with that individual all day long. You're going to know all the different stops they make, where they stay, how long they stay, and then with their journey back home again. So if your analysis required it, you could certainly calculate the amount of emissions you know, that that particular individual created. And maybe when you look at all the travel combined, you could see how much of the daily emissions are coming from this particular area of town versus this particular area of town. So you can see we're getting into a much more disaggregate kind of approach. And uh, that may lead to different kind of policies that might emerge. So that's what that's all about. Okay, mobility, um, really not too much difference here. The current models certainly measure how easy the, you know, it is to get from place to place, the accessibility, the degree of congestion, how easy it is by transit. That's, that's not going to change. We're still going to have that functionality. Equity, this is an area where there's going to be a huge difference with this model because we're, again, modeling individuals. Okay, I have to say that over and over. Um, you are going to be able to do uh, much more of a comparison between alternatives um, on a much more disaggregate level. So how did Sally react under alternative one as compared to alternative two? And we know a lot about Sally, okay, in terms of a lot of specifics about her as an individual, her age, income, things of that nature, okay? And uh, so consequently, by having that discrete information at your fingertips, uh, getting into equity, ty equity type analysis is going to be a huge. 
So I think that will be a big area where this tool is important. Pardon me, forgot to move the slide. Okay, okay, your job is to remind me if I don't do that. <laughs> All right, um, okay, so now we're looking at some of the key features. As I've talked so far, I've, I've brought them up a little bit. It's hard to talk about them without <laughs> bringing them up, but just sort of as a, as a summary piece here, we are going to be modeling individuals now, okay, not households, individuals. What we're going to be doing is, during the course of this model, for every individual, we're going to be developing daily trip, sorry, daily uh, activity patterns for them. So for this person, what do they need to do during the day? It might be as simple as going to work, going home. That's all they have to accomplish. For others, it might be a little more complicated. They start at home, perhaps. They need to go to work. They have a big meeting at night. Then they come home, okay? Maybe somebody is going to mix in a noontime little uh, errand or something from work to their store, for example, and then back, okay? Each and every person is going to have some type, a tour associated with them, okay? So that's how all of the individual, uh, that's how all of the um, travel, if you will, the movement is going to be expressed, tours. I talked about roles. Now, what people with all these different roles, um, another th reason why these are important is because they have different kind of tendencies about them. I mentioned some. One of them is uh, trip start tendencies. If you have a job you have to get to at 8 o'clock, for example, you know, depending where you live and how close you are, your tendency is going to be leaving home probably around 7-ish or so. But if you have a... Um, Let's say you work at uh, a retail store downtown. Maybe you don't need to be there till 10-ish or so, depending what your shift is. Uh, that would change your, your tendency of when you need to leave, all right? So these roles are important. Uh, also, I mentioned value of time, modal preferences. That has a big deal, too. Again, some people, depending on what you have to do for the day, have a lot of flexibility in what they can choose uh, for a mode of acts, for a mode uh, as they make their travel. Other people, other people, depending upon their role, depending upon their responsibilities, depending upon their time constraints, they may not have that flexibility. So, roles are huge in this model, really huge. I've talked about intra-household uh, dependencies already. What's going on in your household makes a big difference. Okay. The internal clock, I've alluded to that a little bit. Um, as I said, the model is going to be starting at roughly 3 in the morning. It's going to march through the day at roughly every 15-minute increments, okay? And conditions will change along then, perhaps the cost of travel, the degree of congestion, the transit availability, things of that nature. So. Um, what, what could happen, uh, again, I'll use the example of a person who has to be at uh, work or uh, maybe there's a, an important lecture you have to be at at a certain time. Uh, you're going to be very conscious of that time and you're going to do what you need to do to get there. Well, maybe an hour or so ahead of time, let's say an hour and a half ahead of time, there's going to be a certain probability of, for some people that will want to leave at that time to get there early or just depending upon what degree of uh, extra time they want to allow in their planning. But it might be a low probability. As you get closer and closer to maybe an hour ahead of time, the probability of leaving is going to increase. You get further and further along, it's getting really, really close now, the probability is even higher, etc. Some people are going to be late, some people will get late, will be there late, but there will be a probability attached to it. So in essence, what's being used is a, it's called a Monte Carlo approach, for those that might be familiar with that. That, that is what, um, that's the situation I just described. Okay. Um, I mentioned how that clock and the travel choices are going to be uh, influenced by that time of day already, so we can move past that. Okay. With this tool, 
we're going to have the opportunity to really improve our equity analysis because of individuals. And since we're modeling individuals, as we move on to roadway analysis or transit analysis, we can move these individuals actually into specific cars. So no, no longer will we just have generic <laughs> car travel. We can actually attach them to cars and know something about the driver, okay, which will influence choices of how you respond to tolls and other things. Um, the population synthesizer, that's how we get these individuals. Uh, we will have a thing called a population synthesizer. You use census data, you use other models at Metro, which will generate the characteristics that we have to match in terms of age profiles, income profiles, household sizes, things of that nature. And uh, that's how we're going to generate the households and the individuals within them. Now, when we do that, that has the opportunity to link much more closely with our uh, land use model. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Metroscope, but that's a tool that Metro has uh, as well for land use modeling. And um, we can strengthen the connection between those two tools. OK, right from the outset, I indicated that um, this is, uh, pardon me, much more than a travel model. Okay, much more than a travel model. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by that to kind of make it more alive for you. Uh, this, is the, this is the display I'm just waiting to see. I can't wait to see this, okay? Now, we're going to be modeling individuals, as I've said. We're going to know where each individual is at every hour of the day. Okay, imagine, if you will, where you have some kind of a display you have ge geographic areas uh, displayed on this map. On the bottom of the map, we're going to have a little sliding scale, which represents the hour of the day. Okay? So, at time zero, five in the morning, you have everybody all tucked away at their home. Okay? And as you move that scale along through the course of the day, we can see how the population, if you will, of these geographic areas change through the course of the day. You'll see big employment centers grow because more people have migrated to that area for their, for their job, for their school, for whatever it might be. Okay, as you progress a little bit further during noontime, maybe there's a little more dispersion to different places. As you move toward 5 o'clock, you see these big, uh, quote, job centers dispersing a little bit, while residential areas begin to grow a little more. So that's a very interesting display that you can make, um, again, to help not only just transportation analysis, but for health, for um, like advertisers <laughs> wanting to know where people are at certain times. You know, if you can be really creative, you can think of some interesting ways that you might use that data in very non-transportation ways. Okay. Um, another example, because we're doing individuals, we don't have to say just people. We can partition that information by by age by gender, certain income profiles, you know, all sorts of different ways. So consequently, again, for market analysis or anything like that, you know, there's huge value in that. Uh, and it's not just people. We're going to be knowing where all of the cars go, okay? So during the course of the day, hour by hour, or actually 15 by 15 minute, okay, we'll know where the cars are in this region. That could possibly lead to something that um, might influence parking charges or parking availability or transit service or, you know, whatever it might be. So again, lots of disaggregate data is going to be available here. And uh, it's going to really lead to a new era of the kind of questions that can be addressed with the travel model. Okay. Uh, the current model we have reacts to stimuli in very wa various ways. And it is very much a state-of-the-art kind of model for its current, I'm talking about our current model now, okay? Not Dash, our current model. We have, we have a very good uh, state-of-the-art model as it is. But its response to different stimuli is, is limited, okay? It'll certainly tell you how people 
might affect uh, trip rates, perhaps. It might affect where people choose to go. It can certainly affect the modes that are chosen in their travel. We have uh, facilities in the, within this model that addresses the, the time they might want to travel. So it's doing a lot, okay? But actually, there are many more ways that a person can respond to certain stimuli that are introduced to them as they're making their daily trips. Uh, let's look at some of those. Okay, time of day, we'll be able to do that just like now. Trip chaining. Since we're talking about tours, if congestion grows, um, again, hypothetically, perhaps people, instead of making a lot of trips to and from their house, you know, to do different kind of errands, maybe you just might want to do that all in one time. <laughs> Once you're out, you're out, okay? Or you may choose to once you're at a certain location, you may want to pick places around that location to do some of these extra activities that you need to do, um, things like that. So that's, that's a big deal. That, will, that might change how you plan your day, okay? Activity patterns. Um, again, that links to that uh, time of day. You may decide, I, I'm, I'm just being hypothetical, but is, if congestion grows again, uh, it may get more and more difficult to do the kind of things that you normally are used to doing today. So if we look 30 years hence, okay, you may find where more and more of your activities are being uh, deferred to a weekend or an off day, okay, rather than a day you might normally do them, for example. Uh, different, so you, you can definitely plan your day differently, choose where you go differently. Uh, mode choices, our current model does that, but um, as I mentioned, we're adding bike to transit, which is a, a quite a mode of interest these days. Okay, again, that new sensitivity. I mentioned the intra-household dependencies. That, that's really huge. Uh, it's, it's adding so much more to our model where uh, it's a condition that will be imposed upon the decision maker that wasn't there before. You know, what are my obligations for the day? Is this new option for me even a choice in the first place? Okay. Okay, roles. We finally got to the roles. <laughs> what are these roles? As you can see, there's a whole host of roles here. We're not going to go through every one, but the roles come down to um, ages, school or not school, drive or not drive, college, with, without children, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're now out of college, you're working, you're not working, you have children, you don't have children, etc. There's a lot of permutations of all these kind of things. Uh, from looking at survey data, we see that that's how these uh, combinations, if you will, of different characteristics came about. And these were found to be very uh, influential, if you will, on influencing the choices that people are making. So that's why they, we find them in the model defined in this way. I've alluded to uh, some of the reasons why these are so important. Uh, first of all, the tour patterns. Uh, if we take a look at that to-do list in the corner, um, you know, if people, a person gets up in the morning or the night before, you, you mentally have a little <laughs> notepad of the things that you, that you want to get done that day, okay? And so when you get up and you're ready to leave the house, you're going to... Uh, basically get your tour pattern set up so that you can accomplish those needs. Uh, start times, uh, again, depending upon your role and the uh, conditions, the obligations you have in your life that may or may not influence start times. Uh, your value of time is important for those same reasons. Modal preferences, same idea. So roles are going to influence your propensity to do all of those things. Here's a very obvious uh, display, but uh, you heard me talk about tours. Uh, this is a little bit more of a visual <laughs> to associate with that. You can see the person leaves home on the left. Um, this is a suburban or whatever you want to call it uh, location. And this particular individual stops by school at certain times. They leave, off to work, on the way home, stop to pick up some groceries, and then back home. So that's a tour. And you know, you can see how there could be a 
thousands of permutations of these things, okay? Okay, looking at this. This is the framework of how this model is put into code, okay? We'll not go into every box here, but as you can see, we have uh, essentially three or four uh, big major areas there. If we look at the top right in the green, this is where long-term choices are made. So for example, uh, if you're a worker, where are you working, okay? If you're in school or college, you know, where, where's that university at? If you own a car or not, okay? Those are long-term, pretty big decisions. As we move down into initial conditions, this is where we kind of take note. This is where, as the day begins, you're formulating that plan of what you want to accomplish. You're kind of setting up your ground rules for a day, making your, organizing your day, get started, that kind of thing. Then as we move into the red, that's where the real um, nuts and bolts are of this model. This is where it's actually going to develop a complete tour for you, establish what modes you're going to take, uh, things of that nature. And what's really important here is that one sensitivity this model will have is just because you're leaving home in the morning with a certain plan in mind, depending upon how conditions change through the day, you may discover that you have to change that plan, okay? So let's say for some reason you are planning to leave work, pick up a few groceries, go home. Well, for some reason, Remember, um, remember I talked about this Monte Carlo method, the likelihood of, in this case, let's say leaving work. Let's say you don't leave right at 5 or 4.30 or whatever your, your cars are. For some reason, you're not leaving till 6. Furthermore, there's a bunch of congestion out there, okay, if you're driving. And so you may decide just to choose your, to change your plans. You know, it's too late. I don't want to stop and get groceries, get home, cook, etc. You may decide just to stop and get something, bring it home, eat at a restaurant, whatever. So you have the flexibility to change your plans based upon the conditions of the time. And then finally, as we move around this chart, um, you can see on the left side, this is where we take information and we can um, allocate it to roadways and transit networks and do more uh, detailed uh, operational type analysis to see how all of these uh, interactions actually affect uh, characteristics on the ground. Okay, the thing I want to point out here is actually right along the bottom. Uh, typically, what happens when you run a travel model, the product you get is, let's think of it as a matrix. Origins on, on the rows, columns or destinations, how many people go from an origin to destination? You can populate all those cells. That's your typical output. You're not going to have that with this. It's going to be something, it's going to be a table, okay? And what a person's, it's, it's going to look like a diary, essentially. So a diary for, for uh, Bill, and what did, the, what did Bill do during the day? Where did they start their trips? What time did they leave? How long did it take? Where did they go? How long did they stay there? Da, 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 da. Okay, it's a little diary of their day. And all of that is being tabulated in a database like this. Now, that is really important because at its very basic uh, examination, we can certainly query that database and create a trip table a matrix of trips, just like I described, and create one from this database, just like we always do. Okay, that's fine. But we can do so much more now because we're having this record of trips for each individual, as you recall. So let's go back to this whole notion of equity analysis again. Okay, well, before we go there, sorry, let's, uh, the ability to parse this data is now so much more uh, prevalent. We can get in here and we can say, I want to know how many work trips are between 5 and 6 p.m.? I want to know how many transit trips there are between 4 and 6 of a certain income range, or perhaps uh, auto ownership. I want to know, you get the idea. You can just parse this, query this database, 
any way you want. And you can really, you know, the more creative you are, the more analytical you are, you can develop a whole host of interesting uh, findings, if you will, from, from what can be uh, pre developed from this model application. Now, in terms of equity, what we can do is this is just the output of the activity-based model, dash. But there's lots of other databases that are out there. There's GIS databases that talk about land use. There's databases about, oh, oh gee, I don't know. Um, I'm not feeling very creative at this moment either, okay? But you can take this data and say, well, goodness, I want to know um, what is the percentage of people that take transit that live in an area that has a density of such and such or, you know, that kind of analysis. So you can begin to link it with land use files or uh, assessor files or, you know, whatever it is that you have access to. So again, it really opens up the door to lots and lots of analysis, much more than just transportation. Okay, my last slide, then we'll have questions. So where are we? We are very, very early in the process. This tool has been under development for some time, but we are just about ready at Metro to take delivery of the, uh, of the application code for this. And so what we'll need to do after that is go through a period of model sensitivity testing. So what we'll want to do is just, just run this model and through a bunch of hypotheticals. What happens if the auto travel time increases by 25%? How does the model respond? It's not all about, remember my one slide, it's not all about how many people are going to switch to transit. It's going to be, if that happens, how many people are going to change the time they leave? How many are going to just not choose to do that travel and just defer it to another day? You know, there's a lot of different ways to respond, okay? Uh, same with transit. You know, let's say, transit times are reduced by 25% or they're increased or what if we reduce the wait times because, the, uh, because of the ever increasing um, use of smartphones and various apps for what schedules are, things like that. So we can do a lot of different tests and see how this model responds. That's going to help us two ways. One, we can do some comparisons of what other regions have done in their research and just see how you know, comparable we are. Second, um, this will help, help us to understand uh, how this model is going to work. And so as we go about and discussing this tool with our uh, partners in this region, it will begin to um, help them feel more comfortable in how this model is operating and all the different kinds of options that are available for, for the travelers and the people who are trying to, make, trying to fulfill all their daily needs. Okay, so that, that kind of leads us into that term acceptance. You know, it's one thing to build a model, but th this is a pretty complex model, and it's a pretty different model from what we currently have. So consequently, it's not just about building the model. You cannot forget your clients, <laughs> okay? Your clients have to be in a position where they're right there with you. You have to get them to a point where they're excited to have this tool too. So we have to go through a period of, um, you know, I estimated roughly a year, who knows how long that will be, but I could say it could take about a year to do that. That doesn't, doesn't mean you're working with it steadily, but you're meeting with them, you're having presentations, things of that nature. So there you are. That's, uh, that's Dash. Um, we're very early, but we're ready to, um, just about ready to actually put it to its paces and learn a lot more. So, questions? Uh, should I call or do you need to call or how do you prefer to do this? Yes. Uh, maybe a little bit unfair since you guys are still in the early stages, but what disadvantages would the new model in your eyes potentially have over the old model? So what, you know, it sounds like it, does, it will potentially do a much better job at a lot of things, but what potentially could it maybe do worse at or not really improve on that you would like to kind of address. Okay. Uh, there's probably several disadvantages. Uh, so that's our challenge. <laughs> okay. 
Um, but they're going to be real ones. I mean, I alluded to one of them, and that's making sure our clients are comfortable. Okay, that's huge. If we don't solve that, we're nowhere. <laughs> okay, but other ones that are a little bit more mundane. This is a tool that will take longer to run. Um, when, the, the, when this type of tool first started emerging in the uh, academic circles, uh, it was pretty scary because this is a tool that could take 40 hours, you know, like a week to run, if not longer. And, you know, when you're working at an agency that's working on projects that has to produce numbers, it doesn't matter how good the answer is going to be. <laughs> Waiting a week for the answer is just not acceptable. Okay? So one of the conditions upon this tool is that we really can't have it take more than, I would say, 15 hours or so. The idea is you submit it on day one, have it running overnight, it's got to be waiting for you on day two. Now, I hope that's the case. <laughs> we'll actually see it when it runs. But that, that is much more of the typical runtime that you're seeing in this class of models now. Uh, there's parallel processing. There's just more efficient ways of doing some of the numerical calculations. So the uh, computer science industry is helping a lot in this regard, too. Uh, I think those are the two that, you know, there's probably going to be a little bit more data. Oh, here's another big one. These tools are more complex. Uh, as, as it's kind of obvious. And when you look at the code and the different variables involved and the way all, everything is intertwined and conditioned upon this, conditioned upon that, your code is getting more complex. So you have a situation where, and this, this is exactly what we're going to have to face right now. We have modelers at Metro very familiar with how our current model is set up. They, we know all the nuances. We know how it's put together. Um, when, the, when an answer comes out, if something doesn't look right, we know precisely where to look, okay, just because of our experience. With this new class of models and its complexity, you know, bringing all of the team up to speed <laughs> with all of that is it, huge. So um, addressing that can, cannot be underestimated. But those are the big ones that come to my mind. Okay. Yes? Uh, I was curious, have you guys taken into account car sharing in this new model or do you hope to in the future? Okay. That's a superb question. <laughs> okay. And yes, that question has... You know, clearly, that's another emerging thing that's happening as well. And um, we had to make a choice. Do we get this model going and consider it, uh, it's more than a phase one. I mean, obviously, it does a whole lot more to be than the merit of phase one. But if we want to consider this the initial rollout, but then once this is demonstrated its usefulness and acceptance by our, our team, our project partners, I certainly see another um, round of improvements to the tool. Card sharing is huge, where it might require some additional surveys to learn more about the people that are card sharing and the kind of things that are driving those decisions and the, the household uh, characteristics that are leaning toward that as well. Uh, another big thing could be, um, oh, what else? Um, Auto, uh, let's see, what's the auto acquisition has, has been an area of, of quite a bit of interest in, in research over the past multi-years. So I think at one time it was focusing more on maybe the horsepower of the individual of the car for the purposes of emission analysis. Uh, for this region, you know, we're, we meet all the standards, so it's not so important. But clearly, how about uh, non-carbon type cars, okay, where you get your electric vehicles or hybrids or things of that nature? Um, that makes a big difference when you get down to calculating greenhouse gas. That's very important in this region and this state. So um, understanding a little bit more about the motivation for purchasing those kind of vehicles, that type of thing, um, having that embedded in your model, that's pretty important too. So those are at least two examples of different kinds of things that we, we need to address in the in the next round. So that's a good question. Thanks for asking.
Yes. Uh, yeah, Myra, uh, just to follow up on that, not just car sharing, but biking to car sharing, because now there's a lot of cars to go that have bike racks on them. And you can specifically find them if you're going to bike. Um, but also, so the I guess that one of the main differences from this is that it's individuals. But the name still has household in it. So is it like a part where you're still going to kind of look at it and do analysis by household, or is it all kind of individual for them? Yeah, maybe that's <laughs> all right. I don't like that question. <laughs> uh, no, you're absolutely right. Um, yes, we are clearly doing individuals. But the fact that you're at such a disaggregate level, you can certainly aggregate that up and uh, express results in any kind of uh, context you like, whether it's households, whether it's a geography, whether it's an income range, whatever. So we had a hard enough time coming up with words to match dash. So <laughs> don't rock the boat. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, one day. Okay. So clearly, there's people that might uh, leave the region on their tour. For us in this region, once they leave. And if they don't come back, we don't care anymore? Kind of. All right. Now, ask that question to someone at the Oregon DOT and the state modelers. That's an entirely different question because people from Salem, for example, that begin a tour, they might come up here to this region for work, run a few errands afterwards because of a few more uh, specialty shops or you know whatever might be available to them and then head back. So you know, it really depends who your audience is when you ask that question. <laughs> but yeah, it is just a one-day tour. Yes? Uh, Brent Carney. So um, what sort of like factors are being varied between models? Are, the, are these like real-world, like potential metro policy decisions that might be coming up? Or okay. you know, what do you? Sure. Um, Okay, the way to think of this is this is the tool. All right, so I'm talking about the tool. So now it's ready to be used however folks want to. Let's give some examples, okay? Probably our, our bread and butter is at Metro, there's a whole host of different kind of studies being done. There are different corridor studies. Uh, if you're familiar with the Southwest Corridor Study, there's Powell Division, okay? Our modeling tools are being used on those projects to help estimate the roadway characteristics, the transit characteristics that might result given certain kind of alternatives that they want to test. What happens if we put LRT versus BRT versus bus? Okay, These tools are used. So that's one client and a set of needs. And frankly, um, when we apply these models, it pretty much is in a project context. So our council, the Metro Council, they, they don't, at least to date, you know, they don't come to us and say, we want to find out more about X, Y, Z, run your model and tell us. We've never been approached in that manner. Um, and, and part of it is, is funding, <laughs> you know, the, the work, because it gets into uh, where your revenue sources are. Okay, but we really don't see that too often, but frankly, a lot of the desires of policymakers get intertwined into the projects we work on. So you could certainly test different kind of land uses, you know, different kind of things like that. When we do our regional transportation plan, that's a big one coming up. Um, that's huge for testing different kind of policies. Okay, so that's another venue where that occurs. Yes. Spencer Cochran. Um, I was Wondering if the data and model are going to be open source at any point? Yeah, they are. They are. So we'll be happy to provide the university with a copy of this tool when all is ready. Okay. And uh, like for example, let's let's think of the opportunities. Let's say initially you're not too excited about running it because of quote its complexity, but um, you know certainly one could share that database from a particular run uh, or like a couple runs. And that could be a terrific starting point just to begin querying that to, uh, to see what could happen. 
Okay. Yes. I ask about you mentioned that you're now adding the biking to transit. Something that I've always thought would be interesting to know is driving to park and rides and then drive like transit to wherever you're going. Uh, have you thought at all about? Because I feel like that'd be pretty easy to do because it's uh, it's just like merging the data, just like putting in that you want to take the transit. That's an option as well, but. When you do surveys, you sure don't see many people doing that, okay? So the odds of it are, are small. Now, having said that, you know, when you look to the future as different kind of costs start coming into play, as different kind of congestion points start coming into play, depending on what kind of transit is on the ground, um, you know, who knows <laughs> what kind of choices people will make. Yeah. I live out in Milwaukee, so that will definitely like, be a huge factor. Park and ride is huge. We definitely have um, drive to transit. Mm -hmm. Park and ride is huge. We definitely do a very good job of that. I should put a little bit of caveat. Bike to transit, very important. And we really pushed uh, Dr. Glebe to get that in there. But, you know, when, when you do a survey, we really didn't get a lot of samples that did that. We got enough, <laughs> okay. But it's not as many as we'd like. So we certainly had that inner model, and I think we feel good about it, okay? But I think another, another area of improvement that we can look on, we could look at is maybe do a few uh, choice samples, if you will, for people to do that, just so that we can um, enhance the number of observations and learn a little bit about uh, the choice that people are making when they are weighing that mode versus doing something else. So. That's one thing about models. There is always research to be done <laughs> to learn more. That's right. <laughs> Are you listening, Fed federal research dollars? <laughs> yes. Um, and I apologize if you said this earlier. Where is the base data from, and then what additional data do you need to collect that's different than metro scope? Okay, the base data. The base data for Dash first. Yes. Okay. Thanks for asking, because I didn't say that, okay. Uh, in 2011, we did a uh, travel behavior survey for this region, okay. Roughly 62, 6,300 households, households, and all of the individuals within them were interviewed to determine uh, what their travel patterns are. And uh, by doing statistical analysis of that, you are able to determine elasticities between various uh, variables and how they play off against each other. And that's the data being used to estimate all the parameters for this model. Okay, now Metroscope. Uh, oh, please elaborate on your question oh, there. I guess I was curious, yeah, because Metroscope is kind of the model that Metro is currently using. Um, what is the difference, what data, what is the difference in the data that needs to be collected okay. between right. Metroscope and Dash? Okay. Sorry if I'm misled, but Metroscope is our land use model. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Your question is still good, though. I may have misled that. Metroscope is the land use model. But let's still answer your question, okay? Um, our current model, which instead of being a tour-based model like I've been describing, it's the traditional what's called trip-based model, all right? I can't go into that. Time doesn't allow. But um, we affectionately call that Joan, all right? for reasons we won't go into either. Um, all right, so here is our current model. Here is this new activity-based model. Um, boy, frankly, I don't think your data needs are a whole lot different, okay? Um, be, um, you might want to ask a few more pointed questions on a survey, for example. Like, like, for example, in this survey, what we did, this most recent one, as compared to the one 15, 17 years ago, we specifically asked people a lot about bike stuff. I mean, do you own a bike? You know, do you, you know, those kind of things. Because that's proving to be a pretty important piece, <laughs> okay? Because you can't have bike in your choice set if you don't own one, okay? So amazingly, the data is pretty close. I think what you've seen over time is there's just the sophistication in how you analyze the data is, is really Im improved a lot. Okay, so uh, I think that's why I'd answer it, unless 
the experts back here would want to add to that. <laughs> as a precursor to the travel, uh, and, and maybe asking a few more questions about um, uh, preferences, right, or attitudes, I think, are, are one of the other changes. So, so since we can simulate individuals, we can eventually start to think about how those individuals might be different in other ways besides just their roles. We really opened up the door for, for learning a lot more. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that each individual has their own unique value of time uh, value, I guess, to double down it. Uh, is that is that set throughout uh, the length of the model, or no. can the individual's value of time change depending on like the time of day or day of the week or, or something like that? Okay, again, you know, thanks for kind of drilling down a little bit. Actually, what we'll see is each of these role classes <laughs> will have value of time, not so much the individual. But but having said that, it's like you I implied there, it's not like that person in that role, <laughs> or let's say, it's not like that role will have the same value of time all day long, okay? It's going to be, it's going to depend upon what you're doing, where you're going, how important it is that you get there on time, you know, things like that. So it can definitely change. Furthermore, it's not just one value of time. It's going to be drawn from, a, again, a Monte Carlo approach where there will be some variation among individuals. So I, I guess in a way we will, we, will, we will be seeing some unique values of time for individuals. So it, it's all about instead of having everything aggregating up to an average now, it's developing your analytical tool so that you're operating in more of a continuum, if I may say that in an abstract way. Okay. Okay. Good question. Um, what sort of geographic or zonal structure will Dash be using? We're going to be using that in our current uh, zone system. So uh, over at Metro, our, our our modeling system that we use has 2,200, 2,300, something like that traffic analysis zones. Uh, we may be adding more to that just because we're getting asked more and more detailed questions about certain places. But um, that will certainly not constrain the application of the tool. It, um, you know, it, will, affect the, it will affect the runtime because you're operating at more discrete level. But um, it's, only a, it's only computer time. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so think about one of the enhancements of Dash and the integration with Metroscope is that it provides this more refined temporal dynamics of activity scheduling, so the demand for that. But then how are you looking at the supply side of that, so these activity locations, the temporal dynamics of those, thinking of an individual who's postponing their grocery trip at the end of the day. Maybe their local grocery store is no longer open, so they have to go to the front buyer that's farther out to conduct that trip. Um, fortunately, that's not my area of research, okay? So I'm going to have to, I'm not going to give you a very good answer, but I mean, your, your point is exactly right. Okay, I mean, it does vary. I know that this model is going to look at different kinds of land use types, okay? And so certainly, if you're looking for, um, when a person is working, shall we say, in an office type environment, there are typical hours of operation for that kind of environment. If you're looking for a university, there's a different kind of a shift perhaps. If you're talking about a hospital, you know, it's a different thing. So depending what a person is linked to, when you do it is going to be coming into play um, because you've you got to have it make sense. If you're looking for uh, going out on the town at night, you know, only certain kinds of establishments are open, <laughs> you know, later at night. So you're going to be restricted to those as potential places to go. So the DASH tool will recognize that. Where they're located in the region in the first place, you know, how do you allocate those into a future uh, spatial um, you know, a, 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 um, allocation? Uh, th that's, that's where a different kind of tool comes into play. And I can't really address it. Well, certain operating hours.
Um, currently, that's not the case. So I think that's future research. But you're right. It's it's definitely a point that comes into play. It's, I just don't think uh, the quote science has been fully developed behind that yet, and data sources and things of that nature. Good question. Though. I think we are running out of time. Let's thank uh, Richard Walker, Mr. Walker, for a great talk. Thanks for having me, everybody. Just